The Edmund Pettus Bridge spans the Alabama River, carrying traffic on Highway 80 to and from the city of Selma. The center of the bridge is 100 feet above the river, and the way the bridge is built, you cannot see the opposite side until you're at the peak of the central span. It was this feature that meant that John Lewis and the other organizers and marchers did not see the Alabama troopers waiting for them when they started across the bridge in March of 1965. Lewis was followed by a crowd of about 600 marchers, and so when they saw the, the Alabama troopers and law enforcement and a mob of white citizens were waiting for them, they really had no choice but to keep moving forward. The violent struggle that came next would lead, leave marchers beaten, bruised, and bleeding. The 25-year-old John Lewis would suffer a skull fracture caused by a state trooper hitting him in the head. The photos and film footage of the conflict outraged the country. Lewis left that place of crossing, marked by the struggle and bearing the scars on his head of the attack that he in, had endured. Lewis crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge many more times in his life, and he would make his final crossing in a horse-drawn caisson carriage as the country mourned his death and celebrated his life. This time, instead of blood, red rose petals fell on the bridge to mark his way. The struggle on that bridge in March 1965 would forever mark Lewis and the country. It was a pivotal moment for the civil rights movement, and while there was still more violence to come, this moment exemplified the persistent spirit of the movement. River crossings are often dangerous and don't just mark a change in geography, but typically symbolize a change in the person that is doing the crossing. We tell fairy tales and scary stories about trolls and mythical creatures that stand at river crossings or under bridges ready to pounce on an unsuspecting traveler. Jacob crosses the river Jabbok. He has packed up his family, his servants, his livestock, everything that he has, because God has told him it is time for him to go home. But Jacob is scared. When he left home, it was because his brother Esau was ready to kill him for swindling him out of his birthright and taking his father's blessing. But in this moment, Jacob is listening to God and sometimes being faithful to God means taking a risk. He's tried to hedge his bets. He's sent ahead of him lavish gifts to hopefully smooth things over with his brother. His messengers bring word to him that Esau is on his way to meet Jacob and is bringing 400 men with him. So on this night, when Jacob chooses to cross the Jabbok River, he is afraid. He has split up his people and animals and stuff into two groups, hoping that if Esau destroys one, he'll still have the other safely held back. That night, he takes his wives, his children, the mothers of his children, and crosses the river. He leaves them there, goes back across the stream to find himself alone, and that is when he is confronted by a man. The text leaves room for speculation about who Jacob's opponent truly is, but it seems clear that this is no ordinary man. Jacob's opponent is able to hurt him easily, must leave before sunrise, and refuses to give a name. Jacob himself interprets what happens to him as seeing God face to face and still being alive. Jacob leaves this encounter with a blessing a new name, Israel, and a limp. He also leaves the Jabbok, not necessarily at his strongest to meet his brother and the 400 men that are with him. When Jacob does meet Esau, he bows to the ground seven times, 
full and complete submission to his brother who he swindled. And Esau does not greet him with anger, but instead embraces him and they weep together. When Jacob was originally on the run, he had a vision of God's angels coming and going and received God's promise of children. Now as he is returning to an uncertain homecoming, God appears again, this time not with a vision of heaven, but with struggle. Jacob does not so much win the, res win the wrestling match as he endures it and persists through it. He just flat refuses to let go of God until he's gotten the blessing. Because this story is strange and vague and leaves lots of questions unanswered, it invites us into our own struggle with the text. How do we make meaning of this? In what way are we transformed by witnessing Jacob's struggle with God? For me, I am reminded that sometimes following God means being to, willing to risk everything. And that where we are being called to by God is to a place of reconciliation and restoration. And that that is always worth taking the risk. For me, I'm reminded that the moments that cause pain can be transformed into blessings. And I'm reminded that our struggle and pain can transform us and our communities. And that through struggle, the ordinary can be made holy. The world was changed by the struggle of John Lewis and others on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma in 1965. Things didn't change overnight, but they did change. That struggle now has made a bridge named after a Confederate general and member of the Ku Klux Klan a symbol for civil rights. Our country is now locked in struggle, seemingly constant. Pandemic, politics, protests all fill the news every day. And there is a temptation to let go and to give up. But we can't. We are the people of God and we are called to not let go. We are called to keep struggling. We are called to struggle with human beings and God alike to let our pain be transformed into God's blessings. We are called to risk everything for the chance at reconciliation and restoration. In his autobiography, Lewis said it this way, ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, or maybe even many lifetimes. And each one of us in every generation must do our part. That is the life of those that seek a better nation and a better world. And I think it is also a description of the life of faith, because our faith is built on and joined to the generations before us, and we have our part to play to make sure that we pass our faith on to the generations that come after us. Lewis was a man of faith, originally a Baptist pastor, and as he was facing his death, he wrote a letter to be published on the day of his funeral. And at the end of that letter, I think he ended it with a message of hope that is certainly one that we need to hear. A message that invites us, that calls us to not let go of the struggle that we may be experiencing in our country and in our faith. Lewis writes, when historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Amen.